Okay, Vinyl Community, welcome to the Safe and Sound Texas audio excursion. I have the pleasure of introducing Simsy Nichols, who is here. And uh, Simsy is the daughter of Roger Nichols, and that is the recording engineer uh, for Steely Dan and many others, not the writer with Paul Williams, <laughs> who did a lot of great songs as well. So um, two great guys in the industry with the same name, about <laughs> near same era. So uh, really interesting. Welcome, Simsy. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, David. And uh, I, I, can I please say before we get going, yeah. I love your backdrop. I noticed all the Steely Dan records behind you. <laughs> It actually brought a tear to my eye. Um, I, I yeah, I see them, yeah. so I can't wait to yeah. talk about all those that you have. Oh yeah, we will, because I've been collecting them since uh, since literally day one. I'll I can really remember where I was when I heard "Do It Again" the single the first time. Yeah, where were you? I was in a Harvey's dime store in Gary, Indiana. <laughs> mm. Aww. Yeah. see, you heard it. Okay, you heard yeah. it, and then what? I was like, that is so, the beginning of it was so unique and so different, you know, the instrumentation and everything. It was just so different than anything I had ever heard. And there was a record store literally next door to this place. And I ran over there and they hadn't gotten it yet, but they told me what day it was coming in. So I got it on the first day it was released, the single. Uh, and then I got the album, of course. And, oh uh, so, my gosh! Oh, so, I love that! I love yeah. that. Back yeah. in the days where you remember where you were when you when you heard it, and you had to stand in line and like I did. Yes, there were get the days. get it. Yeah. yeah, it was it was the iPhone of the day. <laughs> I, like I even remember that there was a few albums that I I waited outside um, the record store and uh, and and sometimes they would release them at midnight. Like I remember. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Nirvana's MTV Unplugged. I was so excited to get that record. I remember on Halloween, like wow. we had to go to the record store at midnight to get the to get the album. Yeah, yeah. I spent many hours in Peaches Record Stores in <laughs> in uh, Denver when I lived in Denver. So, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, going a little bit on the engineering side, uh, three three of these albums here are quadraphonic albums. They're four channel. So I was mm -hmm. big into four channel. I've had somebody ask me about that, like, uh, you know, t t okay, so tell me about that, because I've had a few people ask me if I have my dad's quadraphonic mixes. Yeah. And so that was the precursor to 5.1, right? That was yeah, where yeah. it was like immersive. Four, yeah, we call it 4.0 now, They because it was basically <laughs> four channels with no subwoofer channel separate. Mm. So it really, but it was four discrete channels. And there were two types of, actually three types of systems. Two of them were called matrix encoding, where it was like canceling the uh, left and the right channels to create a new image in the back channels. And that was SQ and QS were the two brands. SQ being like uh, CBS Columbia. And then, and, uh, then SQ, QS, sorry, was uh, Sansui. Mm -hmm. And your dad used QS, which was actually a better technology. Uh, and so it's uh, so these actually when you play them on like a Dolby uh, uh, decoder or any you'll get some of that four channel. It's not the true QS if you have a QS uh, decoder, but but they really do. And the mixes are different. The songs sound a tad different. Mm. Uh, so they're they're somewhere to be found, I would imagine. Um, yeah, that's another that's another dig. Another that's rabbit a rabbit hole. Yeah, well, I know. Well, if you, I would love to help you try to t trace those down because they have a lot of, uh, they were really well done in their day. I mean, uh, and there's, they actually had eight tracks of them too, I think at the time, uh, which were, um, you know, four discrete channels versus needing a decoder. So anyway, it's just uh, a rarity to have these quads. So that's why I mentioned it. Yeah, I'm happy you did. Because I, I like I said, I, I just recently had someone ask me about those. So there is interest again sure. about having that immersive sound. Yep. Yep, definitely, definitely. And in vinyl, I, you know, I really do wish my dad was here. I'm sure most everybody who's lost someone like they're always like, oh, I just wish they were here. So I could talk to him about this one thing. But yeah. I would love to know what he thought about the vinyl resurgence sure. because oh, 
I think that he, you know, my dad died in 2011, and I think that was on the cusp of vinyl starting to come back. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I would be so interested to, to to hear what he had to say about that. Because, I mean, I think he, like, he left vinyl behind. I mean, my dad was the father, grandfather of digital. Like, he was... Wendell. Wendell. <laughs> yeah, he was the digital. He was champion and not that he didn't like vinyl i think i think i mean i think he just liked the quality that he could get from cds better mm -hmm. but assuming you know the cds were made from the right masters sure because that's sure. a conversation i've heard him say in all oh, the yeah. lectures i've talked about like sometimes the vinyl does sound better oh yeah because they made it from the right master. And then when record companies or whoever, it was time to make the CD, they would just go get whatever was in the vault. Yeah. Or and the, the CD, yeah, sounded less... Subpar. Yeah, than, and, than the vinyl. Which and, I Yeah. And the truth is, I mean, your, your dad was a techie guy. You know, let's face it, <laughs> like me. I mean, I saw some of the computers he used and I go, oh, that's a, that's a digital equipment corporation. That's an Osborne. I remember those computers because I used them because I'm, I'm a programmer too. Mm -hmm. when you say he used assembler language to write this stuff. I know what that means. That's, that's machine language. It's, it's the hardest to code with because it's right at the machine level. So, oh, yeah, he, he I don't know what that. he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. He was, but he was that guy. And so it really was in his wheelhouse to be digital. You see what I mean? I think mm -hmm. it was a natural thing. It was for me too. And back then, and I try to tell people because I'm I'm a big analog uh, fan too. But in the day when digital came out, it was the thing. Oh, the newest! Oh my gosh, you got to do digital. And the truth of the matter, the quality of the digital back then wasn't nearly as good as it is today. It has progressed tremendously. Mm. So, um, so you know, you could only get so much out of early digital stuff anyway. Because the sampling rates were were different, and the equipment, the decoding wasn't as uh, as sophisticated as it got as the '90s and 2000s went on. So, uh, and I'm sure your dad experienced that. I mean, I don't know, was he still doing work in the 2000s? I assume he was. Yeah, yeah. My dad worked. He he, um, you know, he started teaching a lot uh, towards the end. I mean, he taught up until a month before he died like he oh, loved he loved teaching he was, great. he was a great i saw him on stuff he's really great at it uh, he loved teaching 101 too he he was one of those brilliant minds that could um have the patience and the and the and the wherewithal to explain like basic concepts to beginners and he really loved that and i thought that was really interesting because my dad could talk Way up there. Like yeah. way up there. Like, yeah. what are you talking about? But he, he could also, yeah. he could, he could take those really complicated concepts and bring them down to manageable bite-sized pieces for the, the beginning audio engineer. And I really did appreciate, I, I even went to one of his master classes and I'm not a recording engineer. And I was like, yeah, I could do that. Like, that sounds easy. Like anybody could do it, right? <laughs> now, now, did you use the word bite size because of digital? Was that a. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, I, know, I know. And I am not named after Simpty Code. Dad no, Prompt. Yeah, I no. came out before Simpty. <laughs> I came out before so Simpty. Is there a story behind your name? Yeah, my dad, engineer? he just made, he made it up. Wow. He made it up. Yeah. Another thing he invented, I guess, was my name. So. Yeah, he he was so, having a really creative spell in the late 70s, early 80s. <laughs> but, you know, it's so unique. Uh, you know, I've never heard it, of course. And, and but it, it almost it's funny. It fits you, your personality. It's just it really is interesting to me. Your name is uh, quite a reflection of your spirit, I'd say. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. It's interesting, right? How people yeah. kind of grow into their names. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So your dad. So you said your dad was teaching up until uh, toward the end, which is uh, yeah. amazing. Because mm -hmm. uh, I know he, you know, he knew for some time what his uh, situation was. So he lived out his passion. Mm -hmm. Yep, he did. I mean, you know, what are you gonna do? It's like you can't just sit there and think about it. So he was always definitely like a busy, busy guy. So you know, yes, he was working in the two thousands and. 
you know, I, I, I've been looking at his interviews and his lectures for a decade now, because there's always been a goal to make a documentary about him. So I've had the pleasure of kind of learning more about my dad through all these lectures and interviews and stuff I never would have sat through when I was a kid. Like as a teenager, I wasn't going to listen to my dad talk about audio. Like that wasn't where I was. That wasn't what I was into. Uh, I was, I was more into keeping my dad on, on his toes, you know, I was like <laughs> not paying attention to what he had to say. So what uh, it's kind of a long-winded response to you know yes he was working in the 2000s and um it's interesting how digital kind of peaked and then it and then it tanked again with mp3s that he had to kind of battle like the 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 degression of audio <laughs> like it was like there was this great medium to store records in a way that would help keep them, you know, in theory safe for longer than storing them on tape. Like mm -hmm. my dad was a big proponent of digital, not necessarily as a medium, but as like a storage. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he would make fun of analog a lot, but like if somebody wanted to record an analog because they loved the warmth and they loved the way it sounded, he was like, great, record an analog but just transfer it right away to digital. And so, you know, when he was on the uh, board of governors, you know, and the producer and engineers wing, and they would get CDs for best engineered record in the, you know, mid 2000s, he was like, ah, I, you know, it's like these records, they have, there was no range. He was like, he just kind of wanted to throw them all away because they're kind of, there came a time where people were just making everything really loud and compressing everything and nothing had dynamic range. And then you had the right. MP3 and, and he was right. like, how are we spending like a million dollars on a record? And then y'all are compressing it down to like this yeah. thing that has no right. life left into it. Right. Squeezed out. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, you know, he, he he loved digital audio and just like with anything i mean it, it it can be the best thing or it can be the worst thing depending on how the person uses it as a tool yeah yeah and the mastering engineer <clears throat> makes a huge difference and even more so in vinyl because you're cutting it to a physical medium so you have to make sure you control it so that those grooves aren't running too close together to each other. There's a lot of physical things involved in vinyl that aren't involved in, in digital, per se. So, you know, the mastering engineers now in the vinyl world are what makes a difference. You go, oh, if Kevin Gray did it or if Bernie Grunman did it or if Ryan K. Smith did it, then you know it's high quality because they know what they're doing. But it can be done improperly and uh, just throwing it on the record uh, is uh, really, uh, and if you try to do the loudness war on vinyl, it distorts crazily. So it's a whole different, it's a whole different world, a whole different medium. Uh, but what I really enjoyed about what you released uh, with the uh, the video you did, you know, that the quality of that really comes out and it sounds really dynamic. And uh, even through YouTube, it sounds dynamic. Can't imagine what it sounds like in the studio sitting there. Mm hmm. Yeah, that, you know, that tape, I, I, I. I'm so happy we got it transferred. It was sitting in a desk drawer for a long time, but it was, um, you know, when I was moving at the beginning of 2023, I decided to transfer the DAT. And so the DAT tape, my dad had possibly came from a rough mix and, you know, Steely Dan didn't release rough mixes. So it was something that, it, the only way that this would see the light of day is if it was just shared with everybody on YouTube or um, like, you know, we did the story in Expanding Dan and I mean, there, there would never be an official release. It can't be redone. I mean, that was also, you know, in 1980 Steely Dan. I mean, maybe at the best we could get it live. Like that would be fun to hear it live, but you know, that's, 
I think what everybody got so excited about and what I really appreciated is they were like, okay, we know the source of this dad. This literally came from, or the cassette tape, like this came from Roger, the recording engineer from the studio. And it was the best sounding version they had heard and possibly will ever hear in its natural state. Now what's been really fun is these mid twenties, you know, early thirties, these people have been coming to me and they are remixing it. They've created like an AI Robodon. They've created a Robodon. <laughs> My dad actually probably would have loved that. They're like, you know, that these guys and girls out there made like an AI Donald to help like put in the pieces that were missing on the cassette tape. Like that's so good. <laughs> It's scary. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I know. I know. So, you know, right. There is something to say about the feel of, like, what came out of that rough mix. Um, it's genuine. You know, it's, it's the thing. It's, it's the real deal. Mm -hmm. And it's a reflection we haven't had. I was curious, related to that, uh, if um, you had to have any discussions with Donald Fagan or the Walter Becker estate or anything before doing anything with that? You know, I have not talked to them in a while. And what I shared was not like something new. Okay. It already existed on the internet. So what I was just sharing was like a better, better. sounding okay. version of it. Gotcha. So like I wasn't releasing anything like new or, gotcha. Like, I would never do anything sure. with my dad's files that were were not in line with what my dad would do. But that was like, like, like people were already really listening to it to a really crappy improved. version. And yeah, I was like, improved, right? I was like, look, I mean, here you got you, you all have it. <laughs> so, you know. I think Donald has PTSD about it anyway. Like, let's not bug him too much. No, of course not. <laughs> I, think, I think that was I like mean, a... <clears throat> he's, an that intense was... he's an intense person, and, uh, and uh, that really is a benefit, you know, for what he's done. Oh, uh, yeah. But, but I know, uh, and I think I might have emailed you that, you know, I had gone to uh, uh, Analog Productions in Kansas and met Chad Cassum, and they are the ones who are re-releasing Steely Dan on what's called UHQR, which is really high-grade vinyl and remastering by Bernie Grunman. And they, uh, so far, they've come out with Can't Buy a Thrill and Countdown to Ecstasy, and they sound unbelievable, almost in a way like a new experience. Really? Yeah. So what's new about it? So what's compared to like what it's you have, the quadraphonic? Well, the mix is different, so I would never compare that. But okay. let's say back to the originals. I have originals of it. It just opens up the sound stage. It just has a much. I mean, the OGs were very originals. We call originals OG by the way. Yeah, same. Yeah, right. Same. Yeah. So, so um, the originals were always solid, but this kind of took it up a notch. It kind of opened it. It was more airy. It had a little more distinction in some of the instrumentation and vocals. Huh. It just, uh, yeah. And I mean, like Can't Buy a Thrill is, pro is one of my top three albums. So I mean, I know that album like mentally by heart, right? Ooh, I love it. So when you start to hear new things after that, then you know, some, you know you've got something <laughs> that's great. So Bernie Grunman uh, remastered that and, and did a fabulous job. And uh, so... And Pretzel Logic is coming out July 28th. Uh, so, and then uh, Asia is September 28th, I think. And then Gaucho, J December 1st. Ooh, yeah, that, that's fun. So this is a Steely, uh, actually, you know more, more probably than me. So this is a Steely Dan official vinyl yes. yeah, redo. Yeah. What they right? Nice. Uh, that that label is a second, a, like a, a independent label that makes a reissues, mm -hmm. and so they got he got a contract with Donald and Irving Asimov and you know the managers and the labels. Uh, Universal, I think, is where it's at now, and so Acu Acoustic Sounds and Landlock Productions, uh, they are coming out with the high-end versions of that which are all analog from analog tape mastered analog and then press so it's triple a what they call triple a okay and, good yeah and those are all triple a and they're on two albums so they're 45 rpm 
So the songs, there's only like two to three songs per side because that cut is, you know, gives it plenty of room uh, in the cut, you know, to get all the dynamic range out of it. Whereas <laughs> there's a there's a version that Universal releases for thirty dollars, and it's a, just a commercial one. It's thirty three RPM, one disc, and it is the Bernie Grundman master taken to digital and then put to vinyl. So it's an ADA format. And okay. So, so it's I'll say degraded or change whatever. It's it has a digital step. Let's just put it that way. Whereas the ones that they're releasing now don't. Right. So wait, what's that step? It's going from. It's going from in the in the thirty dollar version it goes from the analog master mm-hmm. uh, remaster that uh, Bernie does. Then it goes to and he gives a copy a digital copy of that to Universal. Uh, and then Universal has someone cut that to vinyl. Okay. Yeah. Whereas it, what what they do with um, with uh, the a- all analog is the tape, <clears throat> the original tape that Bernie his remaster is cut to the lacquer, actually that presses the record. So it goes from analog tape to the lacquer, which then presses the record. So mm. there's no digital step in there. Interesting. Yeah, because I. Uh shared a story with um, a friend the other day about my dad uh, driving those lacquer, the first, the, oh God, I don't know. My Master tech tapes. lingo is, a, yes. Master tapes. On dry ice. He put it on dry ice so that it wouldn't eat, like, Oh God, you're y'all's technical, uh, yeah. Oh well, if it may, it may have been a lacquer, I mean, if you know, if it was a physical, uh, you're saying dry ice, I'm not you're that used with tape. So, well, we'll have to have him explain it. I have yeah. a clip. I have a clip I could share with you, but okay. yeah, he he the the lengths that he went to make sure that what they did got to the consumer was was some some major feat. Like they really did that, and my dad took a took a. a went above and beyond to make sure that they delivered the best quality they quality. could. Yeah. And then he was there for the follow through. Like that's also it. Like he, he you know, he, he didn't quite trust everybody to do the right thing. So sometimes he would follow it through all the way till making the, you know, the, 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 the test copies or test the, yeah. yep. Yeah. He would sit there and make he sure should. they used the right thing and, <clears throat> and check yeah. it. And so maybe maybe they've been feeling him from the other side. What they're doing sounds great. I think it yeah. sounds Roger Nichols approved. Yeah. No, no, Chad Chad Kasim's label and what he does reissues. They're they're very um, stringent to using you know original master tapes and following the process, not letting digital get introduced um, unless digital was in the original. Like Nightfly. Tape. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, right. Which sounds amazing, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it's not a question, um, but but yeah, you're right. Uh, so so yeah, Chad is very much in that spirit. There's another label in Germany called Speakers Corner, uh, mm. that, and they they released Can't Buy a Throw many years ago. Of course, it's like three or four hundred dollars on the used market now. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but my point is, there are people who really still you know have that passion for mm. maintaining the integrity of that and that's really what my channel is about a lot and you know i don't know if you heard of mobile fidelity that's a label that a reissue label or mofi Mm-mm. and they come out with they did asia back at wrong side asia back in the 80s they did asia uh and so they always had claim to fame of analog master tape to cut lacquer to that and then last okay. year in late july it was found out that they have been taking uh, original masters, uh, and in some cases copy, but almost mostly original masters, putting them onto DSD, which is digital, which is a like a tape format, uh, and and a and a DSD can be a one bit sample or a four bit mm-hmm. sample. They use four bit now newer, but the point is they weren't all analog anymore. They weren't pure AAA mm. they were analog to digital to analog, and this was a controversy because they didn't tell anybody. Everybody, everybody was always presuming you know they never said they did they didn't weren't doing it 
but they didn't say they were doing it, you know. So it's kind of like sins of omission. They didn't bother to tell anybody, and everybody, mm. assumed, everybody assumed from their legacy that everything was that way. And they even say original master recording on the top. And the fact is, the truth is, it was an original master recording that was used, but it was taken to tape. Mm. And then brought to a analog so why would they do that? I wonder well, to there save two, there's two time or money. Like why do people t- cut corners? Well, there, there was a couple of things. First of all, they started experimenting with that in the late '90s with Sony because Sony developed DSD, and so they they did that on the digital side and released actually uh, Tom Petty's Full Moon Fever using DSD on CD, which. That's already digital. You, that's not a compromised state. But it, at some point, they said to themselves, I think, well, what would happen if we took a and made a DSD copy and tried to make a vinyl of it? And so they did it in 2007 with a release uh, there, and nobody knew it, and it sounded great. And they did another one in 2011, and nobody was any the wiser. And then over time, as they started to have trouble getting tapes because these companies don't want to release these master tapes to be curried across the country or whatever, you know, and so getting tapes was getting harder. So now they can take this DSD recorder, take it to uh, Sony or whoever is the owner and get a copy made, then bring that DSD back and then cut the vinyl from that. Yeah, so my archiving, like your dad said, from mm-hmm. an archiving or backup standpoint, it makes great sense because tapes degradate. That's a fact of life. Mm-hmm. You know, so there is that value. And my thing is, if they would have come out and just said, "Look, we're having issues getting tapes. We find that these sound just as good, and we can, uh, at least, we can freeze that tape's, you know, capability in time." With mm-hmm. that DSD, whereas if the tape is continues to be used, it'll degradate, or even in storage, it can degradate. So they had a great argument; they just never came out with it. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah, you know, better to be forthright and then yeah, just surprise absolutely. people. Yeah, so it's a reputational thing, you know, in that regard. And there, there's a lawsuit, and there's a twenty-five million dollar lawsuit now, believe it or not. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, you know what? That actually reminds me of the lengths my dad went to. Um, put together the big chill the big oh. chill uh, uh record so my dad actually uh, there's stories of him he's talking about doing that and where he actually you know people wouldn't release the master tapes and he had to actually physically like go to someone's house and it was like falling apart and he had to like go with them to the place like they wouldn't release the master right. tapes which I also get because, I mean, things happen. Universal sure. had that fire, which so it sounds like the master tapes weren't in the fire because they did say there was Steely Dan master tapes in the fire, but yeah, that was but in here, 2008, and I, yeah. I don't know. Well, here's the thing. The New York Times article came out, and it stated a bunch of tapes that were in there, and mm-hmm. it later came out that many of those were not in there because they were – found or say somebody said no we've got them over here so iron mountain or something right exactly they never retracted that which i think was a huge mistake oh so it still lives even on the internet if you go look up that article it's still going to say the same thing like steely dan and nirvana and like all these things got burnt up yeah and 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 many of the examples given and turned out not to be true there were presumptions but here's the thing it sounds so often like nobody knows where anything's at you know it's always (laughs) (laughs) that's why my dad you know until he parted ways with steely dan i think he had the master tapes because he was the only one that he trusted sure i mean just because things get lost like you can't really fall i the record companies, I mean, you know, c- come on. There's these huge Goliath entities managing thousands of artists and probably have hundreds of thousands of tapes and lots of employees. And I mean, there's just so many things that can go wrong. You can't really fault them for not knowing where anything is. <laughs> 
Well, if the Library of Congress ran that way, we'd be in big trouble. But okay, true. Like I was trying not to. I, I let. You I'll know. do it. I'll do it. I was trying not to. Say. Yeah. Okay. I won't give them a pass. We'll Sorry. just we'll just say you know record companies that that uh, you know go by. You know, I'm just. Well, no. Here's the thing. Trying to make here's, a joke. Here's the thing. Who would have thought that 30 years later anybody would give a crap? If you know what I mean. I yeah. I mean, <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I'm sure my dad thought like, okay, everything got transferred to digital, and there we go. And now there's there's a swing back to the analog and the and the yeah. the pat and the love there for analog. Okay, right. so I have a question for you sure. then, huh. because I heard this. You know, when I was growing up, my mom, even before she met my dad, and some of my mom's friends said that when Asia came out, it was like jaw dropping. Like it was the best sounding record they had ever heard. Do you remember your experience first hearing Asia? And I want to know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, again, you know, as uh, the thing about Steely Dan for me is that every album in some ways sounds different. You know, there's there's different little things that they do. And that one really kind of did the, the little bit of the fusion, the jazz, and the, it really, you know, really nailed that down. So right out of the box my impression was, wow, they really have moved into a new sphere. And the, the uh, instruments were so clear. You know, they were just so precise. Because uh, I used to listen on headphones a lot when I was a kid because my mom would scream when I played it loud. So, <laughs> But good for you because that's actually a really awesome way to listen to it a is. record. It is. It is. So it was always... Um, just, uh, you know, it was so different and so precise that, you know, my my thought was, you know, somebody has made the perfect album. Yeah. You know. I love to hear it. Yes. Because, because I mean, and I'm a Beatles fan. I love all the original. You know, I love all that stuff. But this this creates like a visceral emotional reaction almost. Mm, I love that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's just the the precision of the instrumentation that they use and everything about it. You know, it's kind of, it reminds me of a really good meal when you know, the cook puts all the right ingredients in the right place and then they present it perfectly to you. Mm. And you take that first bite and you go, oh, now I know why this is $48 and not $12, you know? <laughs> but Asia yes. was not any more expensive than anything else. So. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I love to hear that because I've actually recently been getting into sound therapy. And so I've, I've kind of, I've really, really started appreciating the way that my dad captured sound mm -hmm. and it's almost like in a therapeutic sense where you can, you can hear all these beautiful instruments like you were in the room yeah. and there's something really, really therapeutic about that. And then. And then, yeah, to have it to be presented in a way, I, I mean, my dad got into the re recording business because he hated, and I hate to use the word hate, but he really did hate clicks, pops, noise, surface noise. And he's like, it took away from the music. So that was that was his mission is to figure out, like, you know, I can make this sound better. And he would yeah. build stuff and he would try. And a lot of it was about mic placement. It was about oh, big time where you put the mic and, and getting – the sound as clean as possible. So he didn't have to do anything in the mix. Like he didn't have to put EQ or he didn't have to add the extra stuff at the end. Mm -hmm. And there's something really beautiful about that. Yeah. No, that's a, that is a huge uh, strategic element to the outcome is mic placement. Uh, and, and there's, you know, there's records where uh, I was reviewing one recently and I'm trying to remember which one it was, but it was like the hi-hat hit. You could tell the mic was too far away from the hi-hat. It wasn't catching the crispness of the hit at all. And, and it was really mm. kind of disappointing because you know, it's there, <laughs> you know, and if it was, whether it was not close enough, the quality of the mic, whatever it might've been, mm. I don't know, but you know, it really, and me being someone who, who drums that I'm always listening for that, you know? I'm always kind of more tuned in to the percussive side of the music. So, you know, what I would love to hear, honestly, and again, no slam on any singing, but, you know, just a, a instrumental only versions of these songs where the, you know, on from the mix where the vocals aren't laid in. 
you pick <laughs> Sorry, up. Donald, no offense. No offense, exactly, no offense <laughs> at all. I love the, you know, I just, from that level, I really, I enjoy instrumental versions of songs because I can immerse myself in that part of it more. Yeah, I actually, you know, this got me also thinking that I, I would love to find a Steely Dan song that would be good for my sound table. Like I have a sound yeah. table right now and because you're talking about the quadraphonic mixes and the surround mixes and now I'm like, well, which Steely Dan, Steely Dan song could I feel the most? <laughs> and that's like, right, the instruments, the instrumental stuff. I'll get back to you. I'll start okay. testing it out. <laughs> yeah, I, said, I think I put a note on one of your things that you used the word transducer about your table. I said, oh, I love a woman that knows what transducer means. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've taken it a step further, which is kind of neat. You know, I got into sound therapy on my own and now understanding like, right, who my father was and what my dad stood for. I'm like, wow, this makes so much sense for my life. But like I kind of found sound healing and sound therapy on my own just out of a necessity to not freak the F out. <laughs> I was just am I ner trying to yeah. equalize my nervous system. The past few years have been so intense. Yes. That Absolutely. actually physically getting vibrated by frequencies has been so helpful and, you know, grounding and, yeah. you know, not needing to turn to, sorry, drugs or alcohol yeah, right, to right, calm yeah. down. It, it's like actually feeling these vibrations has helped me a lot. Sure. Um, so I think that like, yeah, with Steely Dan, it's like everybody's having the spiritual experience because it's like sound healing. It's sound yeah. therapy. You're getting all of these beautiful instruments. Just yeah. you're engulfed in this this amazing sound. And then it gets funky and, you know. Yes. I, and I love when they play the opposites. I love when a Steely Dan song is like funky and he's also talking about, you know, really dark stuff at the same time. Right. Like Deacon Blues. I love Deacon Blues. Right. Die behind the wheel. It's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's good. It's good. Can you tell I love Steely Dan? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you're you're right at home with me for that. There's no doubt I know. That. You know, and I did it a lot. I like it took me. It, it took me the past, you know, the past 10 years. I really I really gained more of appreciation for them. Like I didn't just come out loving Steely Dan, you know, and and. It, yeah, I love Nine Inch Nails. I love you know goth music, and I, I love stuff that's really dramatic and I can dance to. I love to dance, but yeah, you know maybe it's about being in my late thirties, early forties. I just I definitely started to appreciate them way more the past five or six years. Yeah, it's funny because I think a lot of us uh, have we've kind of considered Steely Dan music to be kind of mature music in a way. It's, it's very, you know, mature in its formation and its presentation and, and, and what you need to do for appreciation. I think of it, uh, it just, it's just in a different level, you know, totally. And so I can see where that, you know, that makes perfect sense, especially as life changes, you know? Right. Okay. But then, what about the Danissance? How do you feel about that? I have 20 year olds. I have 20 year olds coming to me and saying that Gaucho is their favorite album. I was like, how did you find Steely Dan? And they're like, I mean, maybe my mom played a song, but I, so I, I think that's the music of the day has brought people <sighs> to where they need something that, you know, is, you know, is, uh, can grab them differently. I think that's part of it. I think uh, some people are longing for music that has a little more depth to it or, you know, isn't as commercial. Uh, I think that's really, I think there are people that are like, I've met a lot of them here near at Baylor University. A lot of kids, a lot of kids are getting into jazz now, big time. Mm, I love it. You're yeah. so right. You're yeah. so right. We've been like, there's been an onslaught of like, three note wonders and it's just like with lyrics that are just like i'm sorry popular music but you know i i don't mean to sound like a an old lady but like it's i'm like is the music really not that good today or am i just getting older i can't tell sometimes you know but it's a little of both but it's more of the latter to be honest with you it really mm. is uh, that it's it's just not 
not satisfying, I think. You know, I think, you know, it's funny. You go from generation to generation, but it still has to hit an emotional part of you, no matter what it is. Uh, I was talking to and interviewed Susan Rogers, who is the engineer for Prince. Oh, and, right. Yeah. yeah. And so she's written a book. This is what, so, so, what it sounds like, what music uh, s- says about you. And it's really this whole psycho uh, acoustics thing that she's really gotten into. And I think you would you would definitely uh, have been interesting conversations with her. She's um, she's really uh, in depth in this. She teaches for Berkeley, actually. Okay, um, psychoacoustic. So is that about using acoustics for like it's the, it's the impact si- depression it and anxiety yeah, right, and right. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So mm. it's a lot of these, you know, they're in the same. We're using a little different words, but they're in the same pool of what music can do for the individual. Um, and, you know, mm-hmm. I, and I, I got into it because I had this thing I always said, it's like, how can it be that I can remember the lyrics to a song 50 years ago that I haven't heard in 30 years, but I don't know where I left my keys two minutes ago? I mean, yeah, there's whole studies on that right now. The the school I went to uh, in San Francisco to get my certification, I went to the six-month program school up in San Francisco um, named Globe Sound, and it and it's actually a, a sound therapy school uh, started by an audio engineer. So when I was ready to take a deeper dive into sound therapy, I, I was like, I can't just do a weekend course. Like I am my father's daughter, and I was like, I want to learn about it. Like let's get into it. So mm-hmm. once I found an audio engineer that was also teaching sound therapy, I was like, that's it. That's where I learned. So he uh, has this beautiful school and they do all this research and yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're going into nursing homes and these people that have dementia and Alzheimer's, they'll play a song from their childhood and it's like they come out of it Oh yeah, and it's so beautiful. They'll come out of yeah. wherever they're at in their mind and they'll, they'll start, they'll be, they'll be there in the room and they'll, start, they'll sing along and all of a sudden they can communicate I mean, that is powerful. Mm -hmm. That is so powerful. And that's what I mean when I say I think the kids today is kind of like the ones that are really in tune with themselves. I think Mm. they're kind of going, wait a second, you know. (laughs) I love that. Yeah, there's hope. My dad would be so proud. Yay, kids. Keep it up. Sorry, Sorry, Mike. Yay. (laughs) Okay, look. I... I could go on and on. Obviously, I love my dad. But, you know, it, it's also been about I've been immersed in his teachings for the past decade since he died. Right. Mm-hmm. And so what he would say over and over and over again is every time he went to a school or he did a lecture, is he said, I am so excited to share everything I know with you. Like, I don't keep anything secret because, you know, if there were secrets, nobody would learn anything. And he said, also, I want to listen to good stuff. So if I teach you how to make good sounding records, I'll have some good stuff to listen to when I get older. (laughs) So here's how you do it, kids. And so I'm really, really excited that, 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 yeah, the younger generation is digging into these older catalogs now and going, oh, wait a minute. This is what can happen when people have the time and the money and the patience and the, and the talent to make records. Yeah. Right. Because, yeah. you know, it is it is kind of sometimes great art comes, you know, when you shoot from the hip, you're doing things fast. But yeah. I don't know. Pros and cons. There's also some amazing stuff like in Steely Dan that comes out when you take the time and and you have the energy and the patience to to do these marathon records. Yeah. Well, two years. Yeah. Oh yeah, but you see, you got to realize. I think I think about this too because it's like that record, or the, whether it's a record or it's a tape, it doesn't matter. That that will be around for it will be around forever. However, it's you know whether it can be read off a cassette player because you have one anymore or whatever. But the point is, it's there for posterity. It's kind of like doing these videos. You talked about him, you know, doing things and you know so he could leave a legacy. Well, I'm, I one of the reasons I started the channel was to do that too. 
you know, because I had all this stuff in my head and I had all this experience and I was in radio and I, oh, this and that and the other. And I said, you know, I really hate to just not leave some of that. And the technology exists now to do like what we're doing very easily. So uh, I think it's really critical to do that. And people don't take the time like, you know, as artists, because the label says, I want that record in six weeks or else, you know. Uh, but mm-hmm. a, lot of them, a lot of them don't have the 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 power of steely dan as a as a you know a product either. right yeah or the budgets i mean there just aren't the budgets that there used to be like that was definitely like a golden era in the music industry period not just with steely dan but with the other artists at the time that could have the liberty to do whatever they wanted like there was no budget you know that is like take whatever you need and take as much time as you need like I, actually, I don't know if they said that, but it feels like they said that with Gaucho. I mean, that album took years and was probably, I think, over a million dollars from what I've heard. Don't quote mm. me. But yeah, I, you know, I am so I'm so grateful for you and the other people that are leaving all this information for us to learn from. Because if my dad hadn't had done all those lectures or interviews and stuff i wouldn't have been able to learn all the stuff that i've learned since he's been gone so thank you actually for starting this channel sure I, congratulations actually you just yeah. started it right didn't you uh, do it in 2022 yes i did okay yeah, yeah i did yeah and it's good you know it's good organic uh growth i really have a great subscriber group and uh become part of a bigger community um but, you know, my thing, too, is it was amazing to me how many things your dad did that I knew of them existing, but I didn't have the connection that it was him, like the drum machine, computerization, initially, <sighs> the Wendell, him doing that, you know, uh, yeah. and that's, uh, and, you know, you were probably, you know, I don't know when you came to really know about all those things yourself. When did you really? I mean, I'd always known about Wendell because my dad literally carried that thing around like it was his third child like it was like (laughs) it's a 75 pound blue box so wendell was a a computer that he um altered and built um it it was a drum sampler like he took samples which my dad was really good at recording drums and percussion so he did that and then it, you know, they fed him into the computer. You actually can probably explain this better than I can. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, he basically, okay. So I, I'd love to give your take because I've heard a p- few people say that it would arguably be considered the first digital audio workstation since it was a computer and he sampled uh, drums and percussion and wrote the code to play the beats onto the tape. Like that, in theory, could be considered a digital audio workstation. So it wasn't quite a drum machine. It was like a a digital audio workstation. Like he was (laughs) writing code and stuff. It was like the great grandpa to Pro Tools. But that's how I've kind of understood it. I'd actually love to get your take on it because, I mean, they weren't doing – there was no computers in the studios in the 70s. And – my dad made it out of necessity because Donald had a really uncanny sense of timing. Like he could tell when things were just off beat, like five milliseconds or whatever. It was like ridiculous. Yeah. I think, yeah, he, I mean, yeah, your dad was at a disadvantage in that regard because it was like, he was like, yeah, I know it's not right. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. so, yeah. but, but also my dad loved the challenge. Like he oh, was sure. like, all right, he, that doesn't exist. Let me try to let me make it right. Mm-hmm. So they loved the challenge. Um, so I think that was a perfect storm to create the stuff that they did like Wendell. Cause Donald said, you know, it's not quite right. And he looked at my dad one day and was like, can't you do it? Ah, and my dad was like, yeah, sure. I'll build a machine. And then, you know, he got a budget and he got a couple of weeks and he came back with a computer. I mean, before, before he, gave he before he had Wendell in the studio he was already teaching himself code um he went to an assembly language class with Roger Lynn so Roger Lynn was making commercial drum machines and my dad was just learning to make stuff in the studio so that was where they differed but they were in the same classes and uh and 
I, I mean, yeah. So he was, you know, working with digital audio and I think I heard 1976 and one of his, you know, before digital audio even existed. <laughs> so I am pretty sure he was I, I, the, one of the forefathers of digital audio and definitely helped to push it forward as a medium in the studio. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Wendell is a funny story because it's so interesting that at the time you didn't have machines in the studio and you definitely didn't have machines replacing people. So they named it because they were getting uh, questioned by the uh, musicians union, why there were no drummers on any of the sessions. <laughs> Cause you know, uh, they used it on a few songs on Gaucho and then they completely used it on Nightfly. I think there's only one song on Nightfly that isn't Wendell. And uh, so they started getting questions. The musicians union was like, why, why are there no drummers? And they're like, oh, we're using a machine. And they were like, you can't use a machine to replace people. And they were like, no, it's a, uh, it's Wendell. We're using Wendell, the drummer Wendell. So they named it. So they wouldn't get in trouble with the union. And then what my dad said they did is whosoever samples they use for the day, they'd put them on the session and send wow. like Jeff Beccaro a check. Be like, oh, and Jeff Beccaro get a check and be like, well, wait a minute. What is, what, I, what don't, a, I don't remember doing this. Yeah. What did I do? And his dad was like, just forget it. Don't worry about it. You were there that day. <laughs> take the money and run. <laughs> yeah, take the money. And yeah. so, you know, they had their computer and the drummers got paid and everybody was happy. happy. So, you beautiful. know. <laughs> A beautiful story. <laughs> yeah, so that's why Wendell got its name is is because they were getting uh they were getting funny looks, you know. Yeah, they were wow. getting funny looks by the unions. Yeah, well, that makes perfect sense when you think about it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, and they and and then the record company thought it was hilarious because once you know, then they credited Wendell. If you look on the back of Gaucho, you see, I think you see Wendell as one of the credits, right? Do yep. you? Yeah, is Wendell on there? <laughs> Pull out the uh, inners. Yeah. Here. Well, it says Jeff Percaro. I think because they use his samples. Uh, oh, here's a, let's see. Is Wendell on there? It's all the total credits here. I'm looking at the total credits. Tracking, overdubs. Wendell, yeah. Sequencing and special effects. Roger Nichols and Wendell. <laughs> So I, the story goes that Wendell, uh, since the Wendell was a credit, special effects, sequencing, special effects. It's so, yeah. it's so 80s. Okay. Uh, Wendell got, uh, Wendell was on the list of people. When, 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 when Gaucho got nominated for a Grammy, Wendell was on the list of people as part of the personnel and they had to respond to Naris and be like, wait, 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 no, sorry. Wendell, Wendell is a computer. It's not a person. And the record company thought that was so funny that Wendell almost got nominated for a Grammy. They sent Wendell a platinum record. Oh. So I have a platinum record made out to Wendell for the record Gaucho. <laughs> oh, that is unbelievable. So I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, Internet, that Wendell is the only machine in history to have been awarded a platinum record. That may be true. I mean, I don't think Fairlight got one. I don't think the Lynn machine got one. Nope. Yeah, so Wendell has a platinum record for his you know, work on Gaucho. You know, it would have, been, would have been funny at the end if they would have said, Wendell appears courtesy of no record label. <laughs> Roger Nichols and Wendell. Yeah, Roger. Right. <laughs> now I saw your dad did did release something on cassette once. There's one entry of his in Discogs. Shh, don't say that too loud. <laughs> He'll come back here to haunt us. Don't say. Okay. Don't, okay. No. What? Do you, do you have that? Wait. What was it? Say so a cassette. There is a yeah. There is a there was a release on Discogs. For uh, that shows uh, from your dad, and it, it's uh, I don't know why, but it does. I'll have to look it up later and let you know. I'll definitely look. Yeah, what's the disc? You... What's the cassette? Disc I wonder. Okay, this well, Discogs is like the um, uh, yeah library. You know what that is, right? Yeah, what's the cassette that he's? It's, it's uh, the name of the album is called Harmonic Ocean. 
on worldly music from 1994. Oh, I love that you mentioned that. You know what Harmonic Ocean is? That is, okay, that is an album my dad did with my mom. And it was a meditation album. And what had happened was, is there that is. the Roger Nichols Project. So yeah, my dad being the extra, Mr. Extra, decided that <laughs> he didn't like to listen to meditation albums where they would just loop the same ocean sound. He said, uh, you know, I hate to use the word hate, but he was driven by passion, my dad. My, my passion, to his passion to fix things that he didn't like, right? So, you know, my dad made it a mission to record uh, one hour of perfect ocean sound. Because, you know, when you, when you listen to a meditation CD back then, they would just loop the same ocean sound every few minutes. You'd hear the yeah. same bird or you hear the right. same wave crash. It was just this loop. And my dad was like, oh, I can't relax. So I heard he, that. Yeah, he took he took a few years. It took him a few years. But he would go to Maui to work with Walter Becker and John Denver, actually. My dad yes. went the first time my dad went to Maui was with John Denver, actually. And so he found this beautiful spot, thanks to one of my mom's friends on the backside of Maui called Alelele Falls. And he sat there on the backside of Maui and uh, uh, at the beach to record one hour of perfect ocean sound. And what I mean by perfect is there was no cars driving by and he had a really good microphone, so there was no plane overhead. And it took a couple of years to get it right because, you know, he'd be there for a few hours in the morning before the session and a car would drive by. Oh, I can't use that. They come back some other time. And, oh, I can't use that. Plane flew by. But eventually he got his one hour and then they took that one hour and my mom and my dad made a meditation CD. Wonderful. So that's yeah. what Harmonic Ocean is. <clears throat> okay, cool. Yeah, that was interesting. Thanks for the. Ba I didn't know anything about it. I just happened to look it up, and I wasn't expecting yeah. a actual uh, uh, production to come out besides his engineering work. So, right. Yeah, that's 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 very interesting. Speaking should... of your mom, mm -hmm. Connie, Connie Reader. Yes, the backbone to our uh, family. The, exactly. You can't go without asking how she is. And, yeah. Uh, what's going on in her life? Well, my mom. Thanks to my mom, we have the second arrangement cassette because she kept it in her desk drawer. Um, thanks to my mom, my dad was able to function in the world because she was his studio assistant. She kept the house together. She kept us together. I mean, my dad would be gone for months at a time and he was working a lot. I, my parents lived all over the place because it kind of didn't matter where my dad lived. He would be going to New York or Maui or Nashville or LA. Like, to work on sessions. So for a while we lived in Florida and my mom on her own got uh, the gig with John Denver and she was his backup singer in the eighties. Um, I don't know how many tours, but she was, she was a professional singer and actress. And my dad met my mom on the streets of New York, which can't be done today. If somebody tried to meet me on the street, I'd be like, get away from me. <laughs> so, so, you know, Today, my mom is writing. She's a playwright. She got oh, her. Yeah, uh, I saw that. She got her uh, MFA in creative writing, and she's written plays. And she had her own byline in EQ, and she wrote um, a musical with all original songs. So, and she's having a good time being a grandma. So oh. she's a grandma. My sister has um, two kids, and so yep, she's writing. And um, answering questions when I ask her about this stuff because she was the one that was there. <laughs> I I was just a kid, so I definitely have to ask her opinion on a lot of this stuff. <laughs> well, get as much info as you can because I'm sure there's a lot of interesting stories there. But that's good to hear she's doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, I did Thanks for look, asking. Yeah, th you're welcome. I did. Yeah, I did look her up and saw that she's doing plays, which I do theater. So I was interested in that myself. So. Oh, my gosh. You should talk to my mom. Yeah, yeah she loves amazing. it. Yeah, it's really I love theater. It's so therapeutic. And uh, actually, did you know that the word on the street is my mom is the big blonde referenced in New Frontier? 
Oh, really? Won't you introduce me me to that that big blonde? blonde. She's got a touch of Tuesday well. Oh, she does. Yeah, she Yeah. That Wow, I wouldn't surprise me. (laughs) My mom. Wow. That's a very, very easy line to remember. I remember that that line so well. Yep, and for fun, she had a band in the 90s that she actually named Big Blonde after that. She called her band Big Blonde, yeah. I saw a a video of her, I think it was on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. She was right behind John Denver. Oh, that's such a good video. That's such a good video. My mom had such a great voice. Sorry, Olivia Newton-John. You have a good voice, too, but I think I'm biased, and I like my mom's voice better. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, it was... Yeah, and I read... I I also read that... And I know your dad flew with John, and that uh, John, I think, flew them to Maui once, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, the John... John is a whole nother hour. The John Denver stuff... Yeah, well, I mean, the uh, stuff yeah. that my dad and John Denver did together is a whole nother session. Yeah. I mean, John was an amazing guy. And uh, John didn't fly. John flew. Uh, you know, my dad was actually supposed to be on the plane with him the day that he crashed. So I know he was scheduled to meet him the next day. I remember reading that for sure. I don't know yeah. if changed plans or what. But. Yeah, he had to postpone because, you know, he just got in the plane back from the painters or something. And my dad helped him pick it out and they were going to take it out to test it. And he called John. He's like, I got to I got to meet you there because he was working in the studio. And yeah, John, sorry, that's a little sad yeah, story, so, but yeah. I mean, you just, you never know. So I, I guess I should just be grateful that I had my dad for that much longer because, right, right. I mean, 97, John Denver was so young. That was yeah. so young. He was only in his 50s. I know. And do you know the only Grammy John Denver won, which I know people have, I love award shows. I love celebrating people, but sometimes these award shows can be political and, yeah, and they lose the value of what it's really about. Yeah. I mean, John's only Grammy was for a children's album that he did with my dad that he won actually the year after he died. Hmm. Post. Oh my God. And the post, I can never say that word. Post hominis. Hominana. That one. Manamana. I know. <laughs> I'm a That's the only Grammy John won is a, you know, because my dad produced John Denver 1980 on. Yeah, I know. Actually, oh my gosh, I I know we're coming up on the hour. Oh, is there's no 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 end here. You okay, can do whatever. There's no end. Oh no, yeah. that's the worst. This could be. Don't don't turn this into a Steely Dan session. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Actually, something fun. Depending on when you're going to put this up, uh, July 14th. I don't know if I'm supposed to say it, but I just said it. Pretty soon, we are going to re-release an album that my dad did with John Denver called Live in the USSR. Ah. And what is important about that album is not only, you know, God, history of pizza itself, because we're fighting with Russia again, and it's just like, Cold War again, kind of. So, you know, uh, it's an unfortunate thing that what they were talking about in the 80s is like what we're talking about again today. But it was the first digital recording that they did in Russia. My dad actually brought a mobile digital recording unit. He had F1 machines. Do you know what those are? Mm -hmm. Okay. So he brought these digital recorders and he set it up. And it's just John and his guitar recorded by Roger Nichols, which is a, you know, you know, it's going to be good. And it's the most, it's, I mean, it's the most beautiful sounding record I've ever heard. And I can't wait for you to hear it on headphones. Now that there's Apple lossless, actually, I I really wish, you know, my dad could have seen that, but I'm happy that like Apple is at least doing lossless. So I think that there is some effort to try to get people better. Sure. Streaming yeah. Oh, yeah. content. Yeah. So it'll be uploaded digitally and we can listen to it on Lossless. And I'd be curious to hear what you think of it when it comes out. Okay. No, I will I will watch for that. Cool. 
Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's a wonderful. Uh, yeah, his yeah his career with John is 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 a whole different uh, thing. I know I I read about it and I didn't know as much about it, but yeah, that's uh, that was quite a collaboration that they had as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he just said to my dad, you know, I want my records, I want my records to sound good, and my dad was like, okay, that's what I and, you know, yeah, and and. I, you know, my dad has even said this on tape before that he wasn't necessarily a fan of John Denver songs, but once he met him, he became a fan of John Denver, the person. And then, you know, they created some beautiful recordings together. I think perhaps love is one of my all time favorite John Denver songs. It's so beautiful. Yeah, he really, um, you know, he has a unique style, had a unique style. But he, you know, when I really, when I really got to like John Denver, and this is going to sound really funny, is as a person, when I saw him in Oh God, the movie. <laughs> yeah, what the heck? John Denver, he was such a good actor. Yeah. What happened to that career? Like somebody, sorry, whoever his management was at the time, but what was that missed boat? John was such a good actor. He was cute. He was funny. Yeah. yeah. He was great in Oh God. Yeah. And, I, you know, that was just such chemistry I thought they had. You know, I know. And, and it was just, and it's so, it's a movie that is really never talked about even i think I mean, <laughs> it's so, so good yeah the whole premise of it was just funny you know but then yeah he was he was very he was very you know the role was good for him as a person it seemed to fit him very well you know i mean and and thankfully you know my dad had other people to work with like john denford no offense steely dan but you know steely dan records were like years and like traumatic sure. and like yeah. They're pushing each other's limits. And, and then he'd walk in and a, a John Denver record, I mean, could take a day because the guy, boom, yeah. the guy had like this amazing voice and, you know, it was just so easy and, and, you know, done. Right. It's like, yeah, I think one time they even finished so quickly. They, they were like, you know what? He, John said, yeah, I, I want to do a Christmas album. And they still had the studio for a couple of days and they just like put together a Christmas album. So John was a really good guy. John really put his money where his mouth was, or whatever that saying is. He was like one of the first celebrity. Um, I don't want to say like, you know, ambassadors. He was one of the first celebrities that actually took their star power and used it for good. I think where mm -hmm. he was going to the USSR, like he's the reason that the cultural agreement got signed and people like i think billy joel went over there live in the ussr i think that was mm -hmm. billy joel um and you know he was supposed to be the first person in space and he was really a huge environmentalist like the stuff that he was doing with his star power was so above and beyond um yeah, I love John Denver. It was, always, it was always ironic, the thing about going in space and then the way he passed, wasn't it? That was just such an irony. Have you guys seen that movie, Final Destination? <laughs> no, I have not. It's a scary movie where how you were supposed to die always comes back to get you. It's so bad. Really? So sorry. If there are any scary movie fans on your channel, that's <laughs> definitely a Final Destination moment where John was supposed to be in the Challenger and then he actually still... And they use his song in the movie Final Destination. Sorry to go off on a... Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Tell me in the chat if I have yes. any scary movie friends. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, just let her know. Did uh, One other question uh, related to that, not, not that specifically, but, you know, now that you've kind of gone through this, uh, I see you, you keep releasing like little... I just saw a video on um, work ethic. Uh, from your dad, which I mm -hmm. thought was very much exactly in line with the way I've believed and I've worked for 45 years. And uh, but but, you know, how many of those kind of things do you have tidbits that you can are going to be putting out? So well, first of all, thank you for your service, because it's people like you and my dad that I think keep the world running is like just, you know, people using their time to the best of their ability and doing the best they can. Like, that's how we move forward, I think, as a as a species. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I I I've just now I've been staring at this stuff for a decade and it took a pandemic and a divorce for me to say, you know what? I get, I like, I release this stuff. Like I've been holding it close to the chest oh. for the documentary. 
But I think it just there there came a point where I said, you know what, we could still make a documentary about my dad and and also share this with the public now. Like the documentary won't just be this bits. And you know, once I release the second arrangement cassette. And I started getting all this love. I started getting all this love from people that had met my dad, had appreciated my dad, were fans of Steely Dan, were kids that I didn't have much information, you know, because they just found Steely Dan. I, I said, you know what? If, if they want to see this stuff, they want to hear it, I'm going to share it. So uh, as I go, you know, with, is, you know, to the best of my ability, I, I'm finding these little clips and I'm just saying, you know what? I've been listening to my dad talk about this minute of what his work ethic is about. And I have, I've, I've, I've been inspired by it. I have appreciated it. And, and here, here you go. So uh, there's a finite amount of stuff. Um, you know, I, I've, I've done the best I could with the resources I have to find all the lectures and interviews. Like I found all this stuff after he died because, mm. you know, when he died, I realized like all the stuff we had at home was of him holding the camera and I didn't have any lectures or interviews or anything that he had done. And I know he did them all the time. So I started digging in his email and I found everyone he corresponded with about a seminar or a, and I started reaching out to all the schools and Neris and, and AES and everybody. And I said, please, can you go in your vaults? Can you find footage of my dad? And they were so gracious and so generous to go into their vaults and send me all this stuff. And so, you know, I, 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 I love that people want to see it and hear it. And I am happy that I, I, I could share it with people. I, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just happy that as long as people want to see it, I'm going to share it until I run out. That's how I feel right now. <laughs> no, that's great. And it is, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate that you're you're open to that because, I mean, it it has open. I mean, I'm, I'm on your Discord server. I'm, you know, just it's, it's a lot of opportunities that when we stay closed in, sometimes we don't really get the benefit of that. It's like having a YouTube channel, right? I mean, you don't get, you know, mm. you keep it all locked up. So um, it's time to share. Yeah, I'm glad you're I, having a positive experience. With I you. am, you know, and it's also for me, I feel like it's time for me to move on because sure. I have been looking at the stuff of my dad for so long. I feel like the documentary is going to get done. The tape got released. So I feel like for me, too, it's a little bit of a closure. Like, OK, dad, there you go. Because when he died, I felt like there was a couple of things that he was working on that needed to be finished, you know, and. I mean, of course, my dad didn't care anymore. I, I think it was a way for me to process my grief. I was like, I, I wanted to help him complete a few things that he didn't get to finish, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. I was like, yeah, but after so long, it's just now I'm into the sound therapy and plant medicine. And I want to put my focus on that. It, it's more like, oh, God, I, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing and a curse. Gotcha. to be uh, my father's daughter because like I have to finish what I started. So some of this stuff I started like a decade ago and um, it's nice that it's finally seeing the light and I feel like I can finally move on. <laughs> that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, it is. It makes perfectly good sense. By the way, everybody, her YouTube channel uh, is called Simsy Shares All. <laughs> Please sub her up. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Unless you tell me it's a secret, I won't share it. But uh, Okay. <laughs> but she's, uh, yeah, it's really, she's got some very inter interesting stuff on there and is adding stuff as we go. Uh, so, uh, so great. You know, your dad was, um, you know, there's the behind the scenes part of music that to me is kind of my wheelhouse because uh, it's easy to focus on the band, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're the face of, of the music and all, and of course they they own that and that's their just desserts, but it, it doesn't get to us without all of the processes, whether it's the miking or the, the mixing and the engineering and the mastering and all those steps that get it there. And it's it's refreshing when you know the quality by name 
uh, like I was talking about those mastering engineers. So for, for audio engineering, your dad's name is synonymous with high quality, as are you synonymous with high quality. You've been a great guest, and I've really appreciated getting to know you. And I hope we can uh, again do this sometime and pick up on some uh, further topics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of you and other people like my dad. Like I am definitely a champion of the behind the scenes people because I do. I do appreciate what you all do. So thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Take care of yourself. Okay. Bye. Bye bye, everybody.